about a project we did um, with Cardiff University and with um, Shelter and also Cardiff Met University looking at homelessness services for young people leaving the secure estate and this was a piece of work commissioned by Welsh Government um, but the kind of theme that I'm going to be talking about is um, vulnerable young people exercising their voices in research um, so what I'm going to be doing is to be thinking about a the challenges um, involved in enabling young people to exercise their voices in research and what solutions we came up with uh, to enable that and then be focusing on the perspective shared by young people um, because interestingly those were the findings that dissented or um, were different from the perspective shared by the adults so I think that kind of uh, ties in quite nicely to highlight why it is impo important to ensure that young people are involved um, when um, a piece of work is looking at evaluating services that are provided to them because they had a very different view of uh, the quality of work that was being done to the adults that were providing that service. So um, I'm going, I mean, uh, there's lots one could discuss here in terms of the kind of the language and the concepts that we use um, and in terms of me establishing that there are strong advantages including the voices of young people but I'm going to kind of present this slide quickly and just um, present it as a given um, that it is important to involve the voices of vulnerable people but accept that there are um, valid criticisms levied at some of the the, the terminology that's used in that field. And then also just to quickly um, point out that while the benefits may seem obvious of why one would involve young people if one is indeed researching services provided to young people, interestingly, if you look at the criminological literature and kind of evaluations of this type, it is not usual to involve um, young people. It's more usual to um, either look at um, reconviction studies, to look at the extent to which people reoffend following the particular intervention that's been applied, and or to take on board the perspectives of um, stakeholders in terms of what they think the impact on young people has been. And that's because of involving young people is very challenging. There are lots of kind of practical, ethical, methodological obstacles that one has to overcome in terms of ensuring they're involved. And while I'm presenting uh, this piece as being a piece in which we did manage to involve young people, in fact, it was based on only a sample of eight young people not so bad when you take into effect or take into account that there were probably only around 30 people um, in Wales at the time of our research who kind of fulfilled the criteria around our research so it's not so bad um, but you know that does flag up how difficult it is to kind of to to a get kind of the various permissions and consents that one needs to involve uh, vulnerable young people and then get in the young people to kind of engage themselves um, you know there were quite a few cancelled appointments or people pulling out the last minute or kind of various issues had happened in their life that meant they couldn't participate anyway a, a bit about the evaluation so you know and this links back to what Laura was saying about kind of the situ situational factors that make people vulnerable the behaviors that make people vulnerable the kind of demographic factors that we associate with vulnerability but essentially what this diagram is I'm attempting to show is the kind of overlap between um, young people leaving custody and homelessness and then that kind of the intersection with these other kind of areas of vulnerability. So we know from research by, for example, the Howard League, um, Mike McGuire, Jane Nolan, etc., that um, homeless young people um, sometimes offend. We also know that um, there are many young people who are homeless upon entry to the criminal justice system and that the experience of the criminal justice system can increase the risk of them leaving the criminal justice system being homeless as well. 
so the the purpose of um, the initiative that we're evaluating was kind of to try and put an end to that cycle of reoffending and homelessness um, and try to ensure uh, the Welsh Government was trying to ensure by setting out this national pathway for young people being released from the secure estate that um, that homelessness was reduced upon release. In other words, to try and to avoid homelessness um, when young people are reduced, uh, released from the secure estate and to try and deal with um, potential housing problems very early on in the system, much earlier than has been dealt with before in the system. So even taking into account um, housing problems in, for example, um, the pre-sentence report stage. Um, so an attempt to deal with it at an early stage. So we had these sort of questions um, that, that the Welsh Government tasked us with answering and also um, as part of that, we also undertook um, a literature review before we went out into the field. And the only reason I, I show you this slide is to kind of to flag up at this early stage, because this is a point I'm going to return to, that the literature on, on youth resettlement um, talks about the importance of engagement and collaboration with users. In other words, resettlement's more likely to be successful the more that young people are engaged with and the more that they feel part of the process that's happening to them. So I, I show you that slide to kind of flag that point up because I'm going to return to that in the findings section. So in terms of methodology, in essence, this was um, a multi-method study whereby we did um, an online national survey of um, stakeholders. Um, we did um, semi-structured um, interviews with stakeholders and with young people. And this is a methodology where we had to be um, quite uh, flexible because when the numbers of young people weren't as high as we wanted we decided that we would also do case studies of two of those young people uh, and interview uh, the stakeholders who had been involved in their cases as well to try and get a kind of a more rounded or more comprehensive view of the kind of journeys of those young people and these were 16 and 17 year olds who were um, due to be released or had been released from the secure estate in Wales, which comprises one youth offender institution, one um, secure training centre and one secure children's home. We also interviewed some young people in a secure, um, in a young offenders institution outside Wales because not all Welsh children are held within the Welsh secure estate, they're sometimes held within the English secure estate. So that was the methodology. So in terms of those kind of challenges that I talked about um, or, or flagged up at the outset, um, the way in which we dealt with those challenges was to try and um, bring a balance between autonomy and protection. And what I mean by that is to give um, young people the opportunity um, to have their own say in terms of consenting to participate in, in the project. Also in terms of um, being involved um, as co-producers of the project, which I'll talk about in a moment, and um, sharing their voices in terms of being participants as well but to also at the same time balance that against ensuring that their well-being was protect, um, protected. So whilst we um, undertook what's referred to in the literature as an agency approach to consent, in other words, where the young people were able to consent to their, their participation themselves, so we weren't um, seeking uh, parental can, consent, for example, that meant that ensuring that the young people understood the implications of consenting and being involved in the project became 
if you like, more important. And there was a greater burden on us to ensure that the information was accessible um, and, to, and to ensure that the um, consent forms were understandable, to ensure that everything was provided in a bilingual um, way um, for our Welsh speakers as well. And what proved to be very useful here was using the young peer researchers in terms of uh, giving us feedback on how accessible and understandable those materials were. So those peer researchers were able to tweak our materials um, because these were young um, people who were, had experienced the criminal justice system themselves and of homelessness themselves, and they were able to comment on those materials in terms of how accessible they thought they would be to the young people involved. And I guess similarly with the uh, design of the interview schedules, they were able to comment on how accessible the questioning was or um, whether the particular issues they felt we had neglected. And then balancing that up against um, protection, we had to think very carefully about uh, confidentiality. So one challenge we faced was that Welsh Government uh, wanted us to um, upload the transcripts of um, the interviews with young people and the case study transcripts um, at the end of the project. And we resisted that because even though we'd used pseudonyms to protect the identity of those young people, with such a small population sample size, you know, it would be easy to identify who those um, young people were in terms of the, them talking about the details of their offences and their, their home situations, um, you know, staff, they were naming staff they were involved with, etc. So we, we, we had to resist that. And then finally, in terms of protecting the young people, a known staff member had to sit outside the interview room in case the young person became um, distressed um, in the process of the interview. So those were some of the ways in which we kind of responded to the challenges that the literature cites around um, using um, young people. And just to, to flag up a little bit more about the use of peer researchers. So the interviews with young people were conducted by a pair and that pair comprised a professional researcher from Shelter, the homelessness charity, and a peer researcher. So a person with personal experience of homelessness um, and criminal justice um, prior um, experience of the criminal justice system as well. And, you know, writers like Aldridge talk about um, the use of peer researchers um, of empowering young people to voice their views and share their experiences, to give them the confidence to do so um, and so on. And uh, here's some quotation. Here's a quotation from my shelter colleague who um, conducted the interviews with uh, some of the young people. So this is about the, the peer researcher. Kieran is 21 and from Cardiff, has experienced homelessness and housing instability on numerous occasions and also experience with the criminal justice system. He is keen to use experience to work with people who need support and make sure people who typically don't get a say are listened to and to make change happen. And she says, from my perspective, I don't think we would have had hardly any of the young people speak to us if Kieran hadn't been there. It completely reinforced the need to address the power imbalances that exist between researcher and participant. I saw the young person visibly relax when they started to chat to a peer and the study was explained to them in a way that they could understand by someone who they could relate to. Another interesting important element was the fact that Kieran is mixed race and many of the young people, particularly those in custody, were also BAME as well. So, um, yeah, so there's one of the researchers talking very positively about the use of um, peer researchers, because of course the challenge isn't just to get access to the to the um, young person in terms of consent uh, or, or access to the uh, institution in which the young person is being held also the consent of the young person, but you've also got the challenge of getting them to talk to you when you're actually in the room. Um, I suspect that lots of you have had, uh, you know, kind of the interview, I certainly have the interviews where 
you're trying to chat to someone and you're just not getting anything back. So that was really important that the uh, peer researchers were used. So moving on to the to the findings. So I said that what was interesting in this study is that whilst um, the stakeholders were very positive about the pathway, the young people not so much and probably at least half of them in relation to most issues were quite negative about the pathway and didn't think it was working well. And this was in contrast to the stakeholders that thought everything was going swimmingly. Um, and of course, you know, one will never know the truth of what was happening. One can only rely on perspectives. But if the perspective of the young person is that they're not being engaged with and they're not being involved in the process, then that's the challenge that needs to be attended to, that their perspective is that they're not being involved. Um, so to give you an idea, so this is in relation to the meetings that they were meant to have. So the pathway set out set times during their sentence that they should be having meetings around potential housing problems and what was going to happen about accommodation when it got to release. Um, so the interview says, so you haven't had any meetings or discussions about where you're going to live upon your release. And Harry said, no, maybe you should just sit down with me once a month and say, do you still want to go back to your mum's? Do you want to go into a hostel? Do you want this? Do you want that? They don't. Every meeting I have, they don't talk to me about where they're going. They don't talk about how I'm feeling. They just talk about what I'm doing on the wing, what regime I'm on, when's your release date, normal things, really. So in contrast, the local stakeholders, the people working with these young people, thought that young people were able and willing to talk about um, their housing plans um, right from uh, reception um, into the institution, right through to their release. Um, but, you know, that didn't tend to be the perspective of young people who couldn't recall that they'd had meetings with these uh, stakeholders about their accommodation plans. Again, the sort of stakeholders perspective were that young people were involved in completing paperwork about themselves. But no, none of the eight young people who we interviewed could recall completing any paperwork which asked them about any housing problems or accommodation. Um, so again, that was um, something that where stakeholders and young people, they didn't agree. Um, and in terms of keeping them informed of where they are actually going post-release, in other words, of their uh, destination accommodation, none of the young people had had a chance to visit um, the accommodation um, that they were going to, but they all said they would have liked to have visited it. So that was something that they were all keen on doing. And interestingly, the senior stakeholders said that is something that could be possible to arrange as part of um, Rottle. Um, there were some instances where young people were not informed of where they were going to be accommodated prior to release. So not only had they not had a chance to visit where they were going, but they didn't have a clue um, where they were going. Um, but that said, there was evidently a lot of hard work going on by um, stakeholders to try and come up with somewhere for the young person to live. And, you know, they they seem to be thinking very creatively. I mean, there was one story of how they were going to be potentially hiring a caravan and yacht workers were going to be taking turns to stay with the young person um, in the caravan while something more permanent was found. So, you know, there was lots of efforts and lots of kind of um, unusual ideas being um, mooted around where they could actually house a young person, but that didn't always translate in that being um, uh, relayed to the young person. And the young people often told us that everything was last minute, everything was seen to be done at the last minute. And this is despite the pathway requiring plans to be, put, um, to be uh, initiated at a very early stage. I mean, in the defence of those sort of the statutory agencies, the, the problem is, is that they can't hold accommodation. So whilst they might be able to identify very early on in the process that that young people, that young person is in need of accommodation and they might think of the perfect accommodation for them, they can't kind of hold or earmark that, um, that housing option for them. 
because you know the list of people who, of young people who need accommodation is changing all the time and they kind of if there's someone on monday who needs it and it's available then that person on monday gets it regardless of the fact that there's someone on tuesday who they had thought um would be ideal for it so you know that that's a problem not being able to hold accommodation so to conclude stakeholders and young people had dissenting views and that was particularly around the extent of the collaboration with and information sharing with young people so you know generally stakeholders thought everything was going to plan that the 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 pathway was being implemented correctly and as envisaged um, but young people tended to have a different view and that particularly when it came to the extent to which they were kept informed and asked for their views and opinions on things. So in terms of our recommendations, these were around improving young people's perception of engagement and collaboration. In other words, even if there were lots of efforts to ensure that young people uh, were given the opportunity to express their views and to be kept informed, something wasn't working, that, they, that the young people weren't being able to retain that information or it wasn't being presented to them in an accessible way. So something needs to be done to kind of shift or to improve that perception. Um, you know, and one practical thing that we did suggest was to, to lobby for pre-release accommodation visits because that is going to be something that will lodge uh, information in young person's minds if, if they can actually physically see where they're going to be living. And then, you know, just some thoughts about uh, future work. Um, what, what it really did um, heighten my interest in really was this notion of co-production uh, involving young people beyond just providing data. So involving them in the design of the research. And in this, this wasn't something I did on this project, but what I am in, in interested in doing in the future is to perhaps involve them in the analysis and dissemination of work as well. And, you know, also this idea of giving something back as well, um, not just as a thank you, but to to recognise that they're, they're that potentially there are ways of ensuring that their engagement in the research is helpful for them as well. So whether it is that, you know, in terms of the dissemination, it could help develop IT skills or, you know, media skills or, you know, even something for their CV. But this idea to kind of um, involve young people simply beyond simply just responding to our questions in a room. OK, 